give an announcement a few uh, moments ago. <clears throat> I'll try to be uh, as robust as uh, Thomas, but that's impossible. <laughs> the youth group will meet this week on Wednesday night at 6.15 at the Hampton Auditorium, and it will go to 8.30. Ask Ben Peterson or Jim Trexel for details. So if you've got a person in the youth group, remember they'll be meeting at the Hampton Auditorium at 6.15. Check with Ben and Jim. If you'll take your Bibles and turn with me this morning to our lesson in Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. <clears throat> Titus, one of the faithful followers of the Apostle Paul and was used at various times to go to the church and check on things and get things right. And uh, he was given the assignment to go to Crete where there were a group of new churches and his responsibility was to appoint elders in the churches there. <clears throat> and so he has been given some instructions in chapter 1 of what an elder is, what is expected of an elder and how they are to minister, and they are to preach the Word, teach the Word, without error, without compromise, and they were to do it in a very straightforward way. Then in chapter 2, he talks about the church. How is the church to behave itself? How is the people in the church to behave, and what instructions are the elders to give the church? Older men, older women, younger men, younger women. And he talks about their lives. They are to be encouraged. And they are to be sound in speech. They are to adorn the gospel. And then he tells us in verse 11, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men and instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, to live sensibly and righteously and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope. And the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous of good deeds. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one circumvent you. In other words, you're to be very straightforward. And so he has just given how the church is supposed to live. Now he's talking about what are we to be in the world? All of us are in the world if we're believers in Christ. And I can't assume that everybody here is a believer in Christ. I have to talk to you as though you are, even though the only way you're going to get to heaven is not coming to this church or any church in the world, but it's by placing your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. We are saved by grace alone and faith alone in Christ alone. So now he talks in chapter 3 for a while about, okay, we're living in a world. Now what's our responsibility? How are you and I as a Christian to act in this world? And he says, first of all, we have to be subject to rulers, everything from the government to your employer. If you're employed, then you do the best job you can do, right? Right? You carry out your work and you do what the boss says. You know, you've seen that sign in places of work. I may not always be right, but I am always the boss. And so you obey. I remember being told that first time I had a job outside of uh, our house and our home. I was told to do whatever it was without question. Do it the best I can do. And don't ask any questions. Don't make any comments. Don't gripe about it and say you know better. You do what you're told to do. And if you're doing a good job down the road, you might be able at some point to put some input and give some ideas. Then he goes on and he talks to us a little bit later what we ought to be. Do not malign anybody. Be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. You ought to do this. We ought to be gentle. We ought not to talk about anybody and run them down. Anybody, people know that when you talk to us that well, as a believer, we're not going to be running down the neighbor across the street, how he works, how, what he does, or our relatives or anyone else. And we are to be showing every consideration for all men. 
Then he comes and he reminds us why we are to do this. Why are we to do this? He says, for we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, and spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. Okay? Remember this. Starts out that. Remind them to be subject to all. Now, as believers, we've got to remember from what we came. Now, some of us grew up in a Christian home, and so we didn't commit maybe. We never got on drugs, never became uh, alcoholics, never got into the party scene. We grew up. We're pretty good. Uh, we behaved ourselves in school. We didn't flunk. Went to college, didn't flunk up, didn't get into all the parties, and we were pretty much good old people. But we were all of this that he describes at one time before we're saved. It may not have manifested itself early because we had control of our parents, but even then, when your child grows up and when we grow up, were, did, did we have to be taught by our parents to be sassy, to be selfish? I don't think any of us had to be taught that. We didn't, we didn't have to be taught to be hateful either, did we? Our parents kind of controlled that. If you had good parents, they controlled that. But the problem is our parents faced the very same thing. And especially if they were not believers, these things manifested themselves. When we got into junior high, you started seeing it in, among the, them acting in junior high school, right, junior hires? You get little clicks. You get little snotty remarks. You pick on one another. You make fun of how they dress or don't dress. You make fun of their little idiosyncrasies and that kind of thing in junior high. I'm not expecting junior hires to say amen, but it's true. It becomes a little more exaggerated then in high school. You think you're really hot stuff. You think you're a big man on campus. You think you're it, it all, especially if you're a sophomore. You really think you know everything. By the time you're a senior, you realize maybe you don't know as much as you thought you did. Freshmen are kind of cool and do stupid stuff, and people make fun of them and call them, you know, freshmen. And we were all there. Then we became sophomores. We knew it all. And it took a junior and senior occasionally to knock down, knock us down a little bit of step. And they picked on us. And you saw all these actions in junior high. Well, you would think by the time you're an adult and a college graduate, you'd be over all that stuff, that that would not go on any longer. But it does. And so uh, Paul is reminding us, this is what we once were. We were on all of these things. And he starts out and he says, if we were once foolish. The word fools comes really from a, a, a word from which we, uh, in some cases, get moron. However, that's not the word used here, but it is used in the New Testament of being foolish, being moronic. Here it's a world, word that really means a word that is... Uh, uh, characterizes us of foolish, depicts a person unable to perceive or understand God's Word because his mind is darkened. Uh, we once were there. Take a look, I've got it on a board, but you can turn to 1 Corinthians 2.14 while you're reading it on the board. Being darkened in their understanding excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. When we were unbelievers, we were really hard-hearted. And we really didn't perceive the things of God. We knew some things. But we really didn't love God with all our heart, with all our mind and soul. And in 1 Corinthians 2.13 we read, but a natural man does not receive or accept 
the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. The unbeliever does not know the Word of God. He may get some of it, and he may even say God is love, but he has no understanding what, God of lo what God's love means. You know, the most brilliant human beings that ever lived were some of the most foolish people that ever lived. Some of the greatest intellects, PhDs, are some of the most foolish people that ever lived. Some of our greatest scientists, brilliant minds, think what? We all came from a one-celled amoeba in some pool where lightning hit a dead pond and suddenly you have a live amoeba. And that little amoeba barely lived, but it lived long enough to reproduce. And then you had a freak amoeba, and you now have a protozoa, who eventually formed into some kind of fish, who sometime crawled out of this mess, became an alligator, became a pig. Some pigs went on, and some pigs went back and became dolphins. And they're brilliant minds. And some of the more brilliant politicians that we have, brilliant people, I mean they're brilliant, invent some of the most ridiculous things and propose them as even laws in our country. And you sit here and you say, how can they be so foolish? You know why? They don't know God. They don't know his word. They're foolish. And you see, you see, we were once there. We were once foolish in that we did not know God's word. We didn't understand God's word. And so we make ridiculous statements. Or we did ridiculous things. We're there. So when we look at the world and we see the foolishness going on, Let's just remember that we were once there. And realize they have a deeper need than just their foolishness. They need Christ. That's what they need. They're not going to make anything but foolish things because they're lost. And God is the God of truth. And if you don't know the God of truth, you're going to believe the lie. Satan is a liar. And the beginning of lies. Don't be shocked. We were once there. Remember this. Who is the most of God's creation is the most powerful and all wise. Wisest of all his creation. Who is it? Lucifer. The devil is the highest created being of God. And of all of his creation, he's the most powerful. And would you say he's foolish? You know where the devil's going to end up? In the lake of fire. That's where he's going to end up, in the lake of fire. The most brilliant creature that God ever created is foolish. Do you think he's read the Bible? Yeah, he has. Do you think he's read that he's going to spend in a lake of fire? Yes, he knows that. He's read it. Does he believe he is? No. He believes that he can conquer the world, and he will, through his Antichrist, for three and a half years. How foolish is that? Here's God's word. He sees it, but he doesn't believe it. And by the way, he is called the prince and the power of the air. And he is called the God of this age. So when you see this foolishness and you see the ridiculous stuff, 
from the standpoint of God's word, don't be shocked. You know why? Because in our unsafe state, we were there. We were there. Don't be arrogant. We were there. Not only that, but we were disobedient. That's almost self-explanatory. Speaks of the misuse of good things, which God provided for us to enjoy and twist them into pure selfishness and sinful purposes. Are you shocked at the sexual revolution that we're having and have had? Are you shocked at the immorality that is going on at high places, low places, middle places? The world has taken that which God intended to be beautiful within the confines of marriage and has twisted it. We have people coming across the border and all the sex slavery that is coming with it. All the abortions that we have. What do we expect, quite frankly, from unbelievers? Now, we may not have been in our safe state as disobedient as them, but we were disobedient. And what else can these people do? What else can they do? They need the Lord. They're not going to change it on their own. Yesterday, I drove past the prison in Lincoln. I've done that many times. But it dawned on me in light of what I was singing about this message is they put all these people in there to reform them. Can we reform them? No. What can change? The only thing that can change your heart and their mind is salvation, is personally placing their faith and trust in Christ. We were disobedient. You know, when God in his holiness, picture it this way. Let's say you're standing on the Empire State Building in New York City. There's a taller building than that, of course, but you're on the 104th floor. And you look down from the 104th floor and look down on the street below you. Can you tell if a man is 5 foot 5 or 6 foot 5? They all look the same. When God looks at the unbelievers, they're all sinners. And they've all come short of the glory of God. And we once were disobedient. So we should have a heart of compassion for him, as he said before. We should have compassion on these people. I remember we were traveling years ago. Stopped at a Walmart to pick up stuff. You know, when you go on a trip, you always forget something. So we stopped at Walmart to get something, and we got behind this guy, and this guy had a bald, shaved head, and he, it was full of tattoos. His face was full of tattoos, uh, tattoos. His arms, his hands, full of tattoos. And I thought, what a mess. I mean, I didn't have the love of Christ at all for him. I just thought, what a, what a piece of humanity is this? Well, he fiddled around with change, couldn't get the right change, and we wanted to get back on the road, and he fiddled on his change. And so uh, Faith was ahead of me, and she said, here, I'll get the change for you. Pulled out her wallet and paid the rest of the change that he didn't have. And he said, thank you. And uh, so we went by, and... He was standing there, and he said, I just want to thank you for being gracious. Faith didn't do it as much for being gracious as she wanted to get through this line. <laughs> I'm not blaming her. I was glad you did it, Faith. <laughs> and she said, well, the Lord loves you too. Loves you. She said, well, I wish my mother were that, like this. And Faith said, well, the Lord loves you too. So he opened up his shirt. And there's a big tattoo of Jesus Christ's picture on his belly. I wish I'd have said, it's not the picture of Christ on your belly, it's Christ in you that counts. And we got to talking about that after we got in the car, how bad our attitude was originally. 
and how our attitude turned from one of what a mess to compassion. That guy needs the Lord. When you and I see people, even the homeless or the up-and-outer non-Christian or the tattooed guy or whatever, should we not have compassion? We were once there too, weren't we? Here's what Paul says about the unbeliever in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19, 21. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousies, outbursts of anger. I was at a ball game yesterday, and I had some people just flat get angry with the refs. Now, I saw the game, too, and I didn't think it was the best call, but I mean the names this guy shouted out were unbelievable. Christians don't do that, of course. Do they? You go to a ball game, Behave yourself. If you're a non-Christian, go ahead and yell what you want. That's what we expect out of you. Say what you want. Drink what you want. Do what you want if you're an unbeliever. What they really need is not change of behavior. What they really need is Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Is that true? If they come to know Jesus Christ, they'll change their behavior. Some of you can testify to that here. God has changed you. Don't expect anything different. Crowsing like things of which I forewarned you just as I forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Furthermore, remember that you once too spent your life in malice and envy. This phrase speaks of a lifelong pursuit motivated by evil intent and greed or envy. How miserable is this? Evil, envy do not satisfy the desires that create them. Proverbs 30 verse 15 says, The leech has two daughters. Give, give. I used to swim in, uh, as kids, we'd swim in the Blue River down here. And every once in a while, we'd get a leech. They're ugly. And they're there to suck out your blood. And they're no fun. Well, that's what the unbeliever is. He's a leech. All he wants is something he doesn't have. And never gets satisfied at all. He keeps leeching and leeching. We don't have that anymore. It's not so much in the city, but when you get back in the rural areas, which we are, how many families in this area do you think have been torn apart by inheritance? Can you think of some? How sad. Rather than fight over inheritance, why don't you give the whole thing to whoever wants it? Wouldn't it be better to have the peace of God and love of God and show your love? And how many of us have been caught in, how much will dad and mom give me when they pass away? That's greed. That's envy. That's malice. We once were there, but as Christians, we're no longer there. Remember that when you see that happening. When you see that happening, have passion for these people. They need the Lord. If you love the Lord, you'll love what? Your brothers. Why fight over it? Will you not be taken care of all your life in heaven? 
Can't you go a few years here without it and just show love of the grace of God? You got all eternity, for heaven's sake, to enjoy what he's given us. Uh, I didn't hear any amens, but I really didn't expect any. But really. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 6 to Chapter 6, verses 5 to 9. First Timothy chapter 6. Let's turn there in light of this. We were once there as unbelievers. Now we're not as believers. We're thankful for what God gives us through our parents. We're thankful for what God gives us. But you know what? We don't need it. In First Timothy chapter five or 6, excuse me, 6, verses 5 to 9, we read... Godliness is actually a means of great gain when it is accomplished by contentment. What does contentment mean? Carnation Milk used to advertise, we have milk from contented cows. What do they mean? Their cows just sat in the evening and chewed their cud. They weren't anxious. Don't worry about it. Here's what he says. For we brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it. For if we have food and covering, what's the last line? We shall be what? Content. Why, do we, why are we so possessed to want more and more and more when God has given us everything we need? And God, there are people that God allows to be rich. Thank God for them. We ought to rejoice when somebody gets rich. Not be envious. We're glad for them. If you, can, if you can buy a brand new Cadillac, whatever, buy it. We aren't going to be jealous over it or envious of it. Why? Because God has given us everything we need, right? We got everything we need. When we were unbelievers, yeah, we would be jealous. We're not anymore as believers. So somebody has a brand new this, brand new that. Somebody makes more bushel per acre than me or makes more money than me. Great. God, I'm thankful for it. I'm happy when people are successful. I rejoice with them. I'm happy for them as a believer. I, once I wasn't. You know, I could be jealous over somebody having a larger church than me. I'm happy with Countryside Bible Church. I'm happy with you all. I'm content with you. Some of you may or may not agree with me. I've heard that. That's fine. That's all right. I just have to live for the Lord. I have to please Him. And whether I please or don't please people is really in one way immaterial. I have to please God. I have to do what he tells me to do. And so do you. Once it was my feelings, my convictions, my this, my that. But now, that's been put away. Hateful, hating one another. Family fights. When people are envious of one another and impure motives... Evil motives, they hate one another who stands in their way. They hate somebody that's going to get ahead of them socially. See this in high school, don't you? See it in junior high. Don't you junior high see this? Don't you in high school see this, college? You want to be the big girl on campus, big man on campus, and somebody's ahead of you. So the way you do it is you run them down. You put them down so they can put you up. In high school. What if you're not 
the queen and the king at homecoming. And you thought you should be. Oh, they're nothing. Why are they got it? They got it because they're the teacher's pet. Yeah, it's not funny, but it carries on to adults as too. Carries on to adults as too. Somebody gets the farm before we got it. <coughs> carries on. Sinful passions cannot be satisfied <coughs> by any person <coughs> who appears to stand in the way of our greed must be removed. The climbing of the social or financial ladder causes hurt feelings, enemies, and a disquieted soul. That's where we once were. That's where we were in our unsafe state. Somebody got ahead of us, we got hurt feelings. You hurt my feelings. You know, if you're content with the Lord, how can they hurt your feelings? I mean, really. If you're satisfied and I'm satisfied with Jesus... And I know he's in control. How can you hurt my feelings? I'm not saying my feelings never get hurt. I'm human. But I got to go to the Lord and settle it. Say, you know, I, I don't live that way. We sang that song, kind of a new song. But, I, you know, in, in summary, we are satisfied with God, right? He's in control. So he can't hurt me. He can't do anything. Nobody here can do anything here to get me out of the will of God. Or you. They can, they can yell at you, give names. They can throw sticks at you. They can trip you. They can do all things they want to do. But I, you're in the hands of God. And he takes care of you. Put it bluntly, relax and enjoy the trip. Have faith rest. Trust God and rest. When you're unsaved, of course. 1 Timothy 6.10, For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Have you seen that? Yeah, you've all seen it. We've all seen it. That's the way we were. We loved money more than we loved God. Not anymore because we're believers. We're believers in Christ. Look what happened to us in verse 4. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared. Wow. What changed us? Paul, in this next couple of verses, we'll pick up a couple today. But Paul, in this verse, lists four things. Kindness of God, the benevolence of God, the compassion of God, and this disposition to love men. When you became a Christian, can you think back there? Can you think back there how happy you were that your sins were forgiven? I'm not talking about joining a church. That doesn't save anybody, and neither does baptism save anybody. It's a personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ when you repented of your sin and you placed your faith in him. You were changed. You became a new creature. And the first thing is kindness. How does God show his kindness to us? Our salvation. Think about this. Did you choose your parents? Raise your hand if you did. Your birthing parents. I mean, some of you may be adopted. They chose you. You didn't choose them, actually. <clears throat> God chose you. Out of all the people in the world, God chose you to be born when you were born, when I was born, where I was born, why I was born, the family I was born in. Now God, in his loving kindness, chose you. 
When? After he saw how good you were? Saw how many works you did? You know when he chose us? He chose us before the foundation of the world. Like Spurgeon says, it's a good thing he chose me before the foundation of the world. If he'd have chosen me afterwards, he never would have. Not by works of righteousness which we've done. Not according to our works, but according to his kindness. He had kindness toward us. He loved us. It was the drawing of God by the Holy Spirit, John 6, 44. No one comes to God unless the Father draws him. And that word, as we saw on a Wednesday night, is a strong word. It's a word like, remember when Peter drew in all the fish? He grabbed the fish that were, he went on the other side of the night, as the Lord told him, and he dragged that fish to himself. That's the word in John 6.44. What drew you to the Lord? What made you love the Lord? What made you think good about Him? You were foolish. You were disobedient. You're full of greed. You're full of hate. God just kept gently drawing and drawing and drawing and drawing. You couldn't even resist it. Yeah, you tried. But you couldn't. Think about Paul. Was he saved coming down a dusty aisle at an altar call? The Apostle Paul, Saul? He was on his way to Damascus to, to put Christians in jail, to get rid of the church. And suddenly he's walking along and he got knocked down on, blinded. And he heard a voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? What was Paul's next word? All right, he said, I'm Jesus, whom you persecute. What's Paul's next word? Lord, what do you want me to do? You say, that's a drastic salvation. But let me tell you something. Your salvation was no less drastic than that. You may have grown up in a Christian home and you may not have had what people call a sinful life, but you were internally as sinful as them. You just never expressed it openly. <clears throat> Listen to this. God is kind and loving and gracious in all his acts. Do you believe that? When you talk to worldlings unsaved about God, what is the first thing they bring up to you? If God is a God of love, why do people in the Sudan starving to death? What do they think about God? They think he's cruel. They think he's harmful. They think he's unloving. And they think the God of the Old Testament is a really cruel God. When Adam sinned, he said, the day you eat of that fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what's going to happen? What? You're going to die. They did spiritually, but he lived physically, right? Would, let me ask a question. Would God have been just, fair, to kill Adam and Eve right then and there? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Why didn't he? He's kind. He let them live long enough to have children. And he told Eve, you're going to have a son down the road who's going to crush the head of the serpent and bring you salvation. Now, he could have none of us could be alive right now. None of us could ever exist. But God is kind. The fact that you're here and you enjoy any modicum of life, you enjoy anything of life, the fact you're here and you enjoy anything in life is due to God's kindness. 
rains on the just and the unjust. Do you hear him thanking God for the rain? <clears throat> Hardly. Sunshine, food, and because of our sin, our lives are miserable and people's lives are miserable. And in countries where they've abandoned God, it's pathetic to have to see what goes on there. But the people who turn to God find joy and peace and love. The kindness of God appeared to us in the person of Christ. Luke 6.35, But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be the sons of the Most High. For he himself, listen to this, he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Guess what he wants us to do? Be kind and grateful to who? Evil men and women. How about 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9? The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some men counsel on us, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Why do you think the Lord is tearing, in one sense, his coming? You know some friends that need to be saved? You know a child, a son, daughter? Aunt, uncle, mom, dad, neighbor that needs to be saved. Can you not be thankful that there's still time for them to come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior because God is patient toward us, not willing that any should perish? The sinful man thinks of the true God as his enemy. So they fail to see the kindness. They, say, they fail to see the kindness. Every breath an unbeliever takes is pure, unqualified grace of God. You and I know, as we look back over our lives, we say, man, man, am I grateful. I thought some pretty sinful things and acts toward other people. But God is kind and forgiving. Can we not be kind and forgiving against those that live with us, no matter how bad they are? Since man's created the image of God, he has a sense of morality. So all men are, are able to know right from wrong. Right? They know it. They don't go to God to get their conscience soothed. Where do they go? They take a pill. They take a drink. They take a drug. They get enwrapped in physical exercise. They get enwrapped in some hobby. They get in some side thing to take their mind off their guilt. We have the answers, don't we? We have the answer. Come unto me, Jesus said, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you what? Rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Pray that that would be our attitude as we face the unsaved. We remember how bad we were and how great God forgave us and how wonderful it is to have the peace of God and want them to have the same thing. May they see it in our lives and our actions. May we be willing to share the gospel with these people. They're foolish. They're disobedient. They're full of envy. What else would we expect? I quoted you what John MacArthur said, and I don't listen to John MacArthur much. I don't listen to all. I don't even know what he's preaching on. But I do read his books occasionally, and I caught this little line. Don't be shocked when the unbeliever acts like an unbeliever. 
Don't be shocked if they get in homosexuality. Don't be shocked if they get into transgenderism. Don't be shocked of all these things. Why? They don't know God. You know what the homosexual need, the transgender needs? You know what the politicians need? They need Christ. That's what they need. They need Christ. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away because all things are new. Pray for your neighbors. Pray for your friends. Pray for your relatives. Pray for your children. Pray for your husband. Pray for your wife. That they may know Christ. Let's stand for closing prayer. <clears throat> Father, it's not... I'm not proud that I'm saved. I'm just grateful. I'm just glad you saved me. I wasn't seeking you when you sought me. <clears throat> but I'm glad you sought me. And I'm glad you give me the grace and love to respond positively towards you. And I thank you for saving my soul and the soul of everyone who's here saved, Lord. And I pray for any person here who's just playing a game of religion, who's just playing a Christian game without any really heartfelt feelings, without really knowing you, faking it. I pray that you'd really speak to their heart and soul from God's Word. Thank you, Father, for all you've done. Thank you for your great salvation. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ and the Lord is speaking to you, I'm here. A person that's here you know as a Christian is here. We'd be more than happy to sit down with you and from the Word of God show you that you can have eternal life and know it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.